Joining me today is Suk Ojla, who is a comedian, writer and actor. You may have seen her acting in Black Mirror or EastEnders or in Victoria and Abdul. Um, or more recently, you might have seen her competing on Mock the Week. So Mock the Week, the last few episodes, especially the ones that I've seen you on, have been recorded in uh, lockdown situations with plastic screens between everyone and you're being watched by an audience over Zoom. So what's it been like going on something? I've imagined that's something that you start out wanting to do as a comedian and you get there on Mock the Week and it's really strange and there's no one in the audience. What's that been like? Well, the, the first time I did it, there was an audience, um, but obviously a socially distanced audience, uh, which was great. Um, and then the second time I did it, it was purely a Zoom audience. But I think I, I, I get so anxious about that kind of thing, um, any anything telly, and especially when it's something as a major as, as Mock the Week, that I um, I kind of come around full circle and they ju- just don't feel anything. <laughs> <laughs> I, kind of like, I get really anxious in the, in the days leading up to it and then when it comes to it I'm like I'm not I'm not a person I'm just this nebulous kind of thing just floating around because that's the thing um, one thing I've noticed about Mock the Week is you're quite often on there with people that you've toured with and people are friends with the people they're on there with so I imagine if you take the audience out is it not a little bit more like just hanging out with some friends yeah and to be honest everyone's really really lovely like it's still a terrifying thing to do but everybody's so nice um and obviously it's lovely when you when you know when you know somebody doing it that day um and in a way a lot of it you don't really need the audience um you know it's not that important to have an audience because you're kind people are fairly generous about laughing at each other's jokes and yeah it can just feel like a chat um but with a clear winner and uh, <laughs> I don't think it's any coincidence, Alex, that both times uh, the team that I was on won. So. Oh, no, of course. I'm sure. Yeah, um, I, I don't play around. I don't no. like, you know. <laughs> it's, I know the points the don't mean anything, but really, let's be honest, it, it is about the winning and not the taking part. So how about with the Zoom audience? Can you actually hear them laughing at your jokes? Because when you listen to the show... You can hear them and it sounds sort of a bit too clear. And I'm trying to work out whether we're listening to something that's been added in afterwards or actually <laughs> listening to what everyone is, you know, how they're laughing in their own homes. It just seems a bit odd to me. What can you hear when you're on set? You can actually hear the, uh, the laughter and the feedback really, really well, uh, which I was really surprised by because I thought there would be a bit of a delay um, because I've done Zoom gigs before, um, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, and there's always a delay but obviously you know they've got slightly more sophisticated technology than um, my laptop so <laughs> that doesn't really work that's not working today um so yeah it, I, I was quite surprised by that because I, I'm not gonna lie I was a bit nervous about having a purely zoom audience um, but there was absolutely zero delay and there were some faces on screen which was really lovely um and there were some faces that weren't of course but the the audio was fantastic although you know, I have no doubt that they, they do a bit of jiggery-pokery um, in post. You've been doing stand-up comedy for about four years now because you started your performing career in acting. Yeah. Um, and you studied to... You didn't go to university. You went straight from school into uh, drama school. And you've spoken in your comedy about having quite a traditional uh, Punjabi upbringing. And I sort of imagine that that might have been a difficult thing to broach with your parents to say, actually, I want to, I want to act, I want to perform. So was that something you had to sit them down and say, this is what I want to pursue? Uh, yes and no. Yes, it's been difficult. Um, yes, it's only really earlier this year that they came round to the fact that this was not a phase. Um, so, th- <laughs> so it's taken them exactly half of my lifetime to come round to that fact. Because <laughs> I started at 18 and I'm 36. That's, that's the right maths, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it has been difficult, and it probably they'll probably never be in a place where they go, "Darling, you're wonderful. We love you. We're so proud of you, uh, and yeah, we're going to support you all the way." But they they support me in their own way, and I I don't blame them for that at all because um, uh, for anybody who's listening who is uh, comes from an immigrant background, um, your your parents kind of moved to. A different country or move to England to basically get by really to try and make something of themselves and it's very much about living in survival mode and uh, you know keeping your head down and working and having a secure job and then your only child 
who and you want them to have like the best of the best of course your only child turns around and goes I, I choose a life of uh, poverty <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and being a clown um so yeah so I went to drama school at 18 which I, I wouldn't I'll be honest I, I let's be realistic I wouldn't really recommend that to anyone I was just really sick of school and sitting down at a desk um since the age of five uh, and so at 18 I was like well I'm done really I'm not particularly academically gifted um and I I just want I just don't want to do that I wasn't like I'm gonna be an actor and I'm gonna be brilliant and amazing and famous um I just I just wanted to do essentially do GCSE drama again for two years <laughs> What did your parents actually have planned for you then? Because it must, as I say, it must have been a bit of a shock for you to go down this route. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so to go to uni at eighteen, um, to do to do something, whatever, whatever degree, they they were not that fussed with as long as it wasn't the arts. Um, to get engaged in my last year of university to a man that they approved of, um, to then um, work for like a year or so, uh, and then get married, and then pop out three babies by the time I was thirty. Okay. Uh, I've I've done I I went to uni in the end I did go I went, I went as a mature student at twenty six so one out of four isn't isn't bad. What did you go and study? Um, oh God, don't! This is during my wilderness years where I was just basically just a, a lost child in an adult's body. Um, and I went and I did a degree in events management because um, I, I like organising things. <laughs> basically because I like organizing things and I wanted to be like JLo in the wedding planner um I um yeah went and did did events management and uh, hated every single second of it there was no part of it that I enjoyed apart from get this the group presentations which nobody wanted to present and I was like yeah of course I'll get up there and present this still not realizing that performing is my forte I think that must have been a bit of a sign to everyone around you because I've never heard anyone in the history of group presentations be the most keen person to do it. Everyone, that's something you end up with, not something you put yourself up for. Yeah, so no, I that was must have been a sign. the one. Yeah, yeah, you'd think it would be. You'd, you'd think it would be. Uh, it wasn't. Um, no. It probably. I think other people were like, oh, you're really confident. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, that's surprising. <laughs> There's so many, so many examples like that over the years that I just did not do anything creative because I didn't think there was a space for me in the acting industry. I'm still not sure there is. Um, <laughs> I just kind of turned my back on the whole thing for about seven years, and but then did stuff like that and didn't blink an eyelid um, and didn't really attribute it to the fact that um, my life's calling is to be a performer. So once you do realise that you want to be a performer and you start getting a few acting jobs and things like that, it's not long before you transition into being a comedian. So what brought, out, what brought about that sort of change? Um, I think it was turning 30 and having a breakdown, really. Um, one, one of many. Um, I just turned 30 and I was like, <laughs> I'm so unhappy. I was like, how am I so unhappy? And there's something about entering a different decade. You know, like you kind of enter your 20s and you're still a child and you enter your 30s and you're like, oh, this is, this is like adult time I uh, yeah I turned 30 and I and all I could think was I've been so incredibly unhappy in my 20s that I refuse to have another decade of feeling like this and um, I I decided to go back to acting and I decided to give it a year which is a very short time in this industry um, because I just thought you know if absolutely nothing happens after a year if I don't if I don't get any nice jobs, if I don't even have an agent or anything after a year, then I'm going to go and train to become a primary school teacher. Wow, so you're sort of really flip-flopping around trying to find something that fits there. I didn't think, I thought you'd say, oh, I'll go back to acting, but that's, uh, you'd sort no. of, you've had enough with that, have you? Well, no, I kind of, I kind of did it when I, when I, I basically, I was for seven years, I, like, I went to uni, I did that terrible degree, I, um, I worked, um, uh, in schools, um, as a teaching assistant, as a learning support assistant, I worked with um, children with special needs, I moved on to working with adults with learning disabilities, and I was like, okay, fine, I was like, I'm really unhappy doing this, um, I feel like I never really gave acting a shot, because I stopped acting at 23, and um, and then I thought, I'm just going to give acting a go another go, and everybody around me thought I was insane. Um, they they just thought they were like what are you what are you doing everybody's buying houses and and everyone's getting married and and they have they have matching earthenware and 
and, and you're <laughs> like, what, what, why are you like being polite? Why are you doing this to yourself? And I just thought, I thought, let me just give it a go because I can't let go of the fact that I never gave acting a proper shot in my early 20s. Um, and then like within a year, everything changed. You know, I got an agent. I had a small part in the Black Mirror Christmas special. I started auditioning again. Um, yeah, and so I never, I never did that PGCE. I've read about you suffering with anxiety and depression, and I wanted to know if you could give anyone who's in a similar industry to you any advice mm-hmm. on how to cope with that, because you're constantly dealing with, when you're working with an agent, you're constantly doing auditions and, and gigs and things like mm-hmm. that. It must be very difficult to deal with that sort of rejection, because it does happen as a, for anyone starting out. And how do you, how do you yeah. kind of cope with that sort of thing? Oh God, I, I, wish, I, had a, I wish I had the answer. Um, I think the biggest, okay, let's be specific. The biggest thing, like rejection is really tough. Rejection, um, I read somewhere, registers as physical pain um, on the pain scale or whatever it's called. But um, I was once rejected. I I once went for 12 auditions in a row and didn't get any of them. And this, yeah. (laughs) And this wasn't that long ago. This is just before I got Game Face. So this was, what, last year? Um... And I have been so, you know, with my acting career especially, so kind of like one foot out the door and always seeking that kind of stability that obviously acting is never going to give me or gives anyone. Um, I'd say, oh God, just be so kind to yourself. Be so gentle with yourself and try not to numb your feelings. Um, so I got rejected for something recently, a play that I really wanted to do at um, the theatre that I've walked past since I was 18 and first at drama school and thinking I want to be at that theatre that big theatre on the south bank which I don't know if I can say its name but you know the one I mean and um and I didn't even get past the first the first stage you know essentially I auditioned and did get a recall and um even though I know that that job would have meant uh, like an absolute nightmare in terms of moving things around and uh, you, you know, it just would have been logistically really tough and I wouldn't have been able to, like, concentrate on editing my book or anything like that. It still really hurt. And the one thing that I now do with rejection in particular is sit with it. Like, feel gross about it, feel sad about it, feel angry, feel the shame, feel all of those things that it brings up and it will pass so, so quickly. For me, the problem always arises is when I suppress it or when I try to numb what I'm going through with alcohol or whatever or try and distract myself um so and also gosh uh, get a really good support system whether that's friends family whoever online um seek help in any way professional help in any way if you're struggling um you know I've you know when I first started acting and I was living in London and it was you know things had kind of really slowed down and I was 31 I think and um I, I like definitely call the Samaritans in the dead of night, like crying and <laughs> and crying so hard that even tissues were not like stemming the flow. I remember just having like a bath towel to hand, like you know what, you know, one of those <laughs> ones where you're just like snotting and crying everywhere. Um, yeah, and honestly, it's it's whatever whatever works for you, whatever works for you. Gosh, do it, just do it. It's it is a hard industry and it takes a lot of time to build up the emotional resilience that you need. In order to in order to get through you mentioned there your book which is called sunny and that's your debut novel uh, could you tell us a little bit about what that's about uh, yeah so sunny is uh, about a woman called sunny uh, she's a uh, British uh, she's Punjabi she's uh, 30 and she's moved back home and she feels like her life has completely stalled um, so she's living with her uh, her parents who are who are fairly traditional and she feels a bit lost and all her friends are feel like they're zooming ahead with their lives and she feels like she's taken 10 steps back she's gone through a um a pretty awful breakup and um she's trying to find love and she's trying to uh yeah i guess basically she's trying to kind of find happiness in the wrong places uh by kind of launching herself into into dating and whatnot and um she basically finds out that really uh, that that's not the key for her. Um, but in the process, she becomes a lot closer to her mum 
and Alex, the real love story is between Sunny and her mum. Um, oh. so, uh, <laughs> so it's it's a comedy. Uh, it, well, it's funny. It's you know hopefully touching. Hopefully people find it touching. It talks about. Um, you know the first second generation experience in England it talks about uh, being you know it's working class it's um, it's about love um, there's mental health stuff in there and it is very very loosely autobiographical okay I'm saying that because I've written a sex scene and I don't want anyone to think that that's the kind of thing that I would do <laughs> Sook, what would you like to offer up as your Who's Flying the Plane hidden gem? Um, so it's a very little-known author called uh, Charles Dickens. No, I won't, I won't do that. Um, <laughs> I, it's, uh, it's, it's an author called Andrew Davidson. And, God, I hope I've got his name right because I'm about to wax lyrical about his book. He wrote a book called The Gargoyle, um, and it's the only book he's written. Um, I believe he lives in Canada now. And I don't know how popular it was at the time. And I don't even know how I came across it. I think I might have picked it up in a secondhand bookshop, maybe. And it's the most beautiful, heart-wrenching tale of love, but with also fantasy in there and faith. And it's just, it's just incredible. Uh, I've read it about three times now. I recommend it to everyone. And um, my best friend, who I met... Um, on a silent yoga retreat, if you can imagine that, um, about eight years ago. And uh, we are so close. I do feel like I've known her in her past life. She's the only other person I know who loves it as much as I do. Um, yeah, and it's called The Gargoyle. So, yeah, if you can get your hands on a copy, please do give it a read. Um, it's truly wonderful. OK, so Sook, thanks a lot for talking to me today. Uh, could you let us know how to follow you on social media and where we can yes. see you doing comedy and when your book's coming out, all that kind of thing? Okay, so I'm going on tour next year. My tour was postponed because of the pandemic. Um, it's called Life Sucks. Um, back on tour next year. Um, all the details are on my website, which is Um or you can find me on Instagram where I'm more generally just farting around on there most times, most days, um, at Sir Kodula, or on Twitter, where I just retweet people who are way funnier than I am. Um, <laughs> and then <laughs> next year, uh, my book is out um, in September time. Um, you can pre-order it now, if you like. It's called Sunny, and um, yeah, that, that's about it. Thanks a lot for talking to me. Thank you, I've loved it. It's been really nice. <laughs>